let's get started here. So it looks like we've got quite a few folks logged in. Thank you everyone for joining us. This is a lot of fun today. Uh, we have a special guest with us who not only shares the first name, at, same first name as I do, which my name is Katie Hawk and I'm broadcasting here from the Oklahoma City metro area uh, for the Nature Conservancy, but also, um, and so her name is also Katie, but she also shares a passion for all critters, great and small, and all creatures, I guess you could say. And she is um, a, an incredibly amazing woman. We're so lucky to have her as a resident here in Oklahoma. She has a passion for pollinators. She has a passion for all animals. She's um, an equine veterinarian as well. Um, her story just is, is incredibly awesome. And so we're gonna get to meet her as well as her mom. Um, we have a special guest here today. So um, Katie Blunk is who will be joining us. And she is uh, doing a lot of work out in Western Oklahoma on her ranch to help save the monarchs. And we are gonna learn from her today. So what I am gonna do is I am gonna quit sharing my screen and I am also going to pin Katie to the screen. You guys should all begin to see her. I'm also gonna unmute her and you all can meet guests today. Katie, can you hear us? Hang on, let me get the mute, there we go. I had to hit the unmute button. Oh, I've gotta just show you this real quick. <laughs> We have a few visitors here that wanted to get in on the special action here. Hey, kids. <laughs> okay. I love it. Fantastic. Well, who do you have with you, Katie? I have my mother, Rose Blunk, with me. She is the reason that I am here today. <laughs> I love it. Freedom, Oklahoma. The day is beautiful. It's a day to be out in the, in the nature. <laughs> And I hope you enjoy some of our scenery today. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you both. I see one more. Who else is with you? Hey, Sagey. Come up here. Sage slaps us every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, she's so good. This is sweet Sage. Yeah, she was our little puppy that we got when we moved back to the ranch back here. Wonderful. Well, Katie, why don't you start us out by telling us about yourself and about the ranch? Well, my name is Katie Blunk, and I am an Okie. I was born right here in Woods County to this wonderful lady in Alba, Oklahoma. But we grew up, actually, um, she moved me to the farm and ranch. Oh, about, you've got to see this. <laughs> about 10 miles northwest of Hartner, Kansas, just a little bit over the, oh, the Oklahoma line. And <laughs> the reason. <laughs> I'm being attacked by 487, and she's too funny. <laughs> so, anyway, born here, grew up here, raised on the farm and ranch. Mom encouraged me to get a job and go out and be something in the world. And what better than to incorporate all my childhood loves, but be to become a veterinarian? I do have a little uh, clarification there. I was a more of a cattle veterinarian actually in Nevada. I work primarily with cattle. I worked for the Department of Agriculture for 31 years in that state. And then that is where I met the love of my life, Michael Hornbet, married him. And in that whole process is where the uh, name Jackass Ridge became legendary. But that's another story in and of itself. There's our wonderful scene of our marriage where we did get married here on Jackass Ridge. I'm being interfered with by pollinators as we speak. <laughs> All kinds are coming around us. Um, anyhow, so we got, we, I retired from my career in veterinary medicine in Nevada, moved back here to Oklahoma where my mother had been, she'd been paving the way for our return, our retirement, and to be able to return to our roots, which we were eager to do so after a life on the West Coast and got back here in 2012 it's where my whole life changed everything my whole focus even how i worked with cattle changed it's just 180 degrees in my world and i've suddenly immersed in my childhood uprearing you know surroundings but with a whole different perspective on what it has to offer us and what we're really here for, you know, to be 
the stewards of the land, to take care of the land, to preserve it. And like my mom did, you know, after my dad died, she came out here, saw this place covered up with cedars and was ready to sell it. It was just an albatross. It was going to be an unsurmountable task. And she went to work and we'll talk more about that later, but she started paving the way then cutting and clearing cedars and getting the ranch ready for, you know, if you build it, they will come. So the kids do come back home and here we are. So where am I at with this, Katie? Where do we want to go next? You are doing wonderful. So tell me, Katie, how, what is your connection to Monarchs? Why Monarchs? What's the connection here? So you've told oh my us gosh. about the ranching and the cattle and the family history, but what's the connection with Monarchs? Oh, <laughs> we're being rocked back here by the cows. <laughs> <laughs> monarchs they're just wonderful i mean it's just an, it's an iconic thing from childhood and i do remember my days out here at the ranch when i would say uh, my grandpa would put me on his favorite horse and i'd go out into the pasture and collect wildflowers and gather the bouquets from the ranch and be amongst the monarchs just I love them. And then the whole thing, the whole thing that has evolved for their, their return here with the practices that we've been implementing on the ranch, it's just, it's just a pleasure to enjoy them every day. And it's always a thrill to see the uh, butterfly plant. We'll be right. We're going to look at them in a minute. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the butterfly milkweed? Yes, yes. Yeah. So what you have up on the screen is uh, our antelope milkweed plant. We have both that and the common milkweed plant out here on the ranch. So oh. Tell me, Katie, tell me a little bit about, uh, you said you talked to me about your Monarch, NRCS Monarch e-kit program. Is that something you can tell me more about? Well, yeah. Um, Mom got involved with them early on in trying to get technical assistance and even some financial support for taking back the lands. And um, that's when she started working with NS, NRCS in the mid 90s and getting involved in all the programs that they had to offer. And also what U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Yes. There was many in the, in the so. local Woods County Conservation District. There were a lot of uh, partnering agencies that she was able to turn to to get help, uh, which it let, led eventually to her getting involved with the local prescribed burn association oh. in the late, like around 2006, seven, right oh. after the burn association had been formed. Well, fantastic. Well, tell me more about this burn association. And, um, you know, you're, you said that they helped you all. So like, these are like magical people who just show up out of nowhere and help you do burns on your property. What's the story there? They are. They're, they're the magicians of fire. <laughs> <laughs> we have such a strong community of uh, neighbors, helping neighbors here. The culture that we've developed in this area Getting the Burn Association started back in the mid 2000s with the help of our uh, NRCS district conservationists um, was integral into forming a, a uh, organized community of ranchers, helping ranchers being able to pool equipment and resources to apply fire in a prescribed fashion to the land in a safe and effective manner. Impressive. Very nice. So just, just out of curiosity here, uh, how, how many people does it take to do a, a prescribed bird on your ranch? Well, the, there's not a set answer to that question. However, we do have minimum parameters that we like to meet, which is part of the prescription and part of the written burn plan. On average, we usually have uh, 12 to 15 people show up to burns, but we've had some burns that we've had as many as 35 plus folks there. And if you, it, it is it is quite the community that emerges. Yeah, there, did you hear that? Good afternoon, ladies. <laughs> so Katie, and tell us. Guys, 
Oh, I'm sorry. You go ahead. I'll yeah, and, and, the, and the spirit of cooperation here is so fantastic. When we call a burn, often it's just the night before, and people drop their chores and what they're doing on their ranch that day to go load up their equipment and go help their neighbor all day long to do a prescribed burn. And that's how we function. And everybody um, is just there for each other in these type. It, it's just an amazing, amazing machine. Wonderful. So what's the connection then from wildfire, excuse me, not wildfires, prescribed burns to pollinators and monarchs? What's the connection there? Oh my goodness. What we've seen with that is when we put good fire on the prairies, the regrowth of the legumes, forbs, native grasses, all the wildflowers, the pollinating plants that are needed and it stimulates, you know, our, our native rangelands are fire adapted. They need fire to, to thrive and to flourish. And so by applying prescribed fire to the land, it just regenerates and invigorates the regrowth of everything and helps to knock back the invasive Eastern red cedar that is taking over our prairies. We have um, some other guests that just showed up on the scene. Katie, would you like for oh, me to spin us. this around? Yeah. Seize the moment. It's here. Let's see. <laughs> oh, yay. Well, this is part of my Nevada heritage right here has moved to Oklahoma. I have three wild mustangs that I adopted from the Wild Horse and Burrow program during my tenure there. Did you adopt the one in the white hat too? <laughs> that would be my husband, Michael Hornbett, and he's been the guy out here for the last 11 years on the ground doing the work, continuing to keep the cedars cut and cleared. Um, I'd like to say that, um, you know, just because I'm in the forefront on the Burn Association and everything, these guys, guys like him, our neighbors, I'm lucky to have him. They're the ones that make it all happen. Well, this is fantastic. I feel like he just stayed, like set up the most epic um, <laughs> scenery for us. So thank you, Mike. This is wonderful. <laughs> if so he knew that he was actually being on video right now, he'd probably pop me on the head with a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> so Katie, you mentioned your role in the Prescribed Burn Association. I, I, I uh, um, what it would love to hear more about your role with with them, and I believe you have, have another role maybe in a few other organizations. Tell us just a little bit more about those other organizations, your role, and um, and 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 then how that led to you meeting us at the Nature Conservancy. Oh, okay. Do you want me to flip this back around, or just leave it on the animals and talk? Well, you know, it, it, the animals are great. Right we work so hard. Well for this show, so let's watch them. Okay, um, well, I am, by default, I had to become the president of the Cimarron Range Preservation Association, which is our local prescribed burn association. I do assume those duties with pride, however, though, because we have such a fantastic group that has evolved over the years that I'm, I, I you know, I, I just can't, believe how wonderful they are and it's just an amazing culture that we've developed so from the, and then that I was involved in that originally uh, we worked heavily with NRCS and that's what led me to the Woods County Conservation District of which I am the chairperson of that board I belong to another really active um, the Comanche Pool Prairie Resource Foundation based up in Coldwater and the other board that I, I'm, I'm not bored because I'm boarded out is I am uh, the newest member to the Oklahoma Prescribed Burn Association, which is our state mother organization whose mission with all of their generous donors like the Nature Conservancy to help support getting local prescribed burn associations formed and fire on the ground in as many places as possible. Fantastic. That's a great so, visual there of um, the prescribed burn associations across the country. <laughs> or the state. I mean, the, the state of Oklahoma. Yeah. And so 
just so everybody knows, once upon a time, uh, I'm gonna, Katie, do you mind sharing or turning, flipping the screen back to you and Rose for us? Yeah, and actually you would really like to see uh, what is happening here. <laughs> okay, well, do, do share. <laughs> Let me get this flipped. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, who is this, Katie? This is Mr. Merlin, the magical mule. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. He, what's okay. his, tell me his story right quick because I'm going to show the folks um, at home a picture right quick of um, him as a baby. So, uh, Merlin was a, uh, a prod, he came in a, uh, he was, his mother was a rescue mare that I acquired in Nevada, long story short. And um, so she conceived Merlin and he was born in my backyard in Reno and has been with me since you know i i created him through uh artificial means and oh, <laughs> oh my god uh, we'll leave the story of that <laughs> this is a picture of him as a newborn is that correct oh, right. Right. Yeah, he came out kind of kind of catty wapus with one ear down he was almost like ehor the donkey but it straightened up over time oh how funny too cute <laughs> So Katie, um, your involvement in these organizations is what is how we got we were connected with the Nature Conservancy um, the, and the work we were doing with Okies for Monarchs. So will you just briefly enlighten us with that connection? How we got hooked up there? Yeah. Well, as the chair, as the one I, at the time, I was just a board member on the Woods County Conservation District, and I, they had actually voted me uh, district board person of the year. So I came to Oklahoma City during the Oklahoma Conservation Commission's uh, statewide meeting that we all attend. And that's where I was hopping all the vendors. And while we were there, it was so cool. It's such a great meeting and get a lot of information out. And uh, that's where I found Okies for Monarchs. And I had my mom, my husband, uh, everybody that was with us come over to see you guys so we could hoard your wildflower seeds. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I hooked up with you guys there at Okies for Monarchs booth at the Conservation District meeting. And here we are now. Yeah, it's like a true love story. We just never look back. <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> So what are some other wildlife besides pollinators that benefit from the work that you and your family have been doing on the ranch to clear cedars and to do the prescribed burns? Oh gosh, well, um, quail, prairie chickens, wild turkeys. We just saw a road runner go by up here. Sorry, you guys didn't get to see it. Oh. Uh, <laughs> we seem to have an abundance of um, mountain boomers out here, which is the Oklahoma state lizard. And, or reptile, I should say, and um, horny toads. I don't know if the fire helps them, but we see a lot when everything's healthy and there's a lot of good things out there to keep everybody happy and whatnot. So, hello, Merlin. <laughs> Merlin's gonna come. I have really just one last question then for you, Katie, before we open this up to our viewers to ask you questions. Well, hey, Merlin, buddy. <laughs> He's a big boy now. <laughs> Grown up. So, so shoot, what was your one last question? What would be your overall message to our listeners today uh, for them to take, take away and take home with them today? What's your overall message? Well, the whole process of using prescribed fire to reclaim our prairies and better our lands, I would just hope to see that more people could get on board with that, even if you just own a few acres, you know, of eradicating some eastern red cedars, you, you know, even those of you in the rural urban interface, you know, can do mounds of good by knocking back the red cedar and what you create on the regrowth of your rangeland, having the benefits for the pollinators, the wildlife, the grazing livestock. <laughs> I'm trying to keep Marlin from. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, hey, buddy. Oh, this is a fun view. <laughs> yeah, that was what Your hair is a little wild today, Marlin. <laughs> All right, so, Katie, people, you want people 
want to um, oh, yeah. learn more yeah. about prescribed burns for their properties, yeah. how would they yeah, go about I, doing I, that? How I would like for people to contact their local NRCS offices or their local county conservation districts. Both of those agencies work together to provide cost share monies to help producers get these practices on the ground. And you can go to this website right here to find your local district offices. A lot of times county conservation and the and the and NRCS are in the same building but not always as is we don't have ours in the same building in Woods County you know we have ours out in Freedom and the NRCS offices in Alva um, also to seek out if you're interested in fire and want to learn more about it uh, to get with the Oklahoma prescribed burn association and get on that website cruise around there, find who's the regional burn coordinator for your area, get in touch with him, join a burn association, become a pyro. If you can't <laughs> fight it, light it. I love it. If you can't fight it, light it. And also, uh, one thing I learned today, folks, is that not all counties have a prescribed burn association. Katie was talking to me about that. And she said that um, one of the things you can do, though, is you can start a prescribed burn association. So if you have the need um, to get this type of service in your area, then um, definitely check out this website and see if there isn't um, an opportunity for you to, to create your own prescribed burn association and or um, contact your local prescribed burn association. All right, Katie, just FYI, I got you on mute for just a moment here. It was getting a little windy. And what we are getting ready to do, we're gonna transition now into the public Q&A portion of the session. So folks, um, find the Q&A button down at the bottom or the chat button down at the bottom. And this is your opportunity to ask Katie Blunk your questions about her work to help save pollinators and the monarchs out on her ranch in Western Oklahoma out in Freedom. Freedom, Oklahoma. And uh, looks like we've already got a few questions rolling in. So give me one second here and I let me bring those up on my screen. All right, so Katie has been sharing quite a bit with us today and there's so much more to her story. It's hard not to share all the details. So this is a great opportunity for you. If there's something more you wanna learn about, now is a great time. So I am going to start with the first question, Katie Blunk. Um, this is from Lynn Rankin. She says she's just taken over her great grandparents' homestead in Roger Mills County. A neighbor that she visited with said there have been very few years the last decade that are good for burning. So she's curious, Katie, do you have any comments or thoughts in regards to um, uh, what her neighbor said to her in Roger Mills County? Now, Katie, you are gonna have to unmute yourself. Okay. You want me to flip this back around? Yeah, Let's flip it back around so we can see your pretty face. There you go. Okay. Whoops, it didn't work. Okay, so um, I can't answer that publicly, <laughs> what I think about response. Well, <laughs> Actually, Katie, I think that, so in essence, her neighbors told her that there's, there's just not been good years to do burning. Well, I'm not sure what that, what that is based upon. There are a lot of different factors that come into play. Drought does play a role and we don't want to, you know, burn up all of our grass that we need to use and not have any moisture on it to come back. So there are management factors that come into consideration, but on your average years, and even in the wild, the, the biggest wildfire years occurred in 2016, 17, and 18 in Oklahoma. And that was that, you know, the Anderson Creek, the Starbuck fire, the Ray fire consumed, you know, they were mega wildfires, 800,000 acres, a lot of loss of everything, livestock, a lot of collateral damage. We were out burning a week after those wildfires, applying prescribed fire to the land. So the conditions were wildfire conditions that year, but that's the whole key to prescribed burning is that you know you're going at it in a fashion that's organized and you come into it with you know the proper prescription the proper weather conditions the proper personnel equipment 
to get the best outcomes and avoid those tragedies. People have an innate sense of fear of fire that's been instilled in them, you know, clear back from the fire suppression campaign that Smokey the Bear launched in the mid 30s. And it's a huge paradigm shift. When, when you talk about prescribed burning or burning, applying fire to land to the people that are uneducated or unaware of it or just have a total fear block of it, of fire in general, it takes, it takes getting to know them and explaining and educating and showing them to bring them around and bring them on board and, and to correct some of those projections that people are putting out there about, oh, you can't burn then or you can't do this. Really, every day of the year is a good day for burning under the proper prescription and conditions. Okay, and so Lynn on here, she also said, Katie, just FYI, she did make an additional post where she said that her neighbors are part of the burn association. So this is an interesting, um, this is it very interesting, Lynn. So another option that you might do is reach out to your con county conservation district to see if you can learn more about why um, or talk with your neighbors more about why specifically. And um, if you do have any additional questions, feel free to reach out um, to us here at the Nature Conservancy. And we can also, of course, connect you with Katie Blunk as well um, to maybe go a little bit further depth, um, in depth on that conversation. So great questions, Lynn, thank you. We have a lot of questions that have been rolling in, Katie. So brace yourself, are you ready? Here's another one. Laura Murdoch um, is curious about how to manage the land for both cattle and wildlife. For example, what do the cows eat? what specific types of flowers, et cetera. So she's curious about managing the land for both cattle and wildlife. Talk to us, Katie. Hello, Laura Murdoch. <laughs> hi, <laughs> Laura. <laughs> and Merlin's saying hi right now too. Um, they go hand in hand. Yeah, they, they, they go hand in hand with each other. And by managing, you know, you have to manage your stocking rate on your side for the livestock end of it. You know, you don't have any control over the wildlife aspect of it, the populations there, but, and you monitor your grasses and your raised plants <laughs> to achieve the proper balance between the two <laughs> so that you do have the correct striking rates. And she, she asks a follow-up question to that. Do you cut your grass for hay? What do the cattle eat in the winter? No, no, we try to manage our ranch with a, a rotational grazing pattern so that we have forage available at different times of the year. And we do that with the use of fire, um, moving the cattle around the ranch to different areas each year on an annual basis, trying not to repeat the same path over and over again, mix it up so that fall range is next year, the spring mm -hmm. range, vice versa. It does require planning and uh, execution of, of um, effective uh, rangeland management. You ought to have a grazing plan. All right, and so this falls a little bit, or actually I do believe this falls right into what you were just talking about. Laura Frossard is asking, other than burning, what can I do to get rid of the red cedars, Katie? Cutting, I mean, you, we like to see you cut them manually, mechanically first and then burn them, but, um, Fire, I'm just, I'm, I'm not gonna even offer another alternative. Fire is the only, it's the most economical and, and effective tool to get rid of them. People that try to spray, it's very expensive and it doesn't work real well. And so you talked about cutting them. How are you cutting them? These are big well, trees, we, you cut them? We cut them um, with like a skid steer. For okay. instance, at our conservation district, we have a bobcat that has a Marshall saw on it that is, uh, people can hire the cutting services from our, co our local conservation district um, or anybody, you know, that's in that business. And it's either like a hydro clip or a saw type implement attached to the front of a skid steer. Hand cutting sometimes in areas, but that's very cumbersome, only in the really hard to access areas that you can't get into with a skid steer, which we have a lot of around here in our canyons. So when you mentioned the, the county conservation district, what I'm hearing you say is not only do they have, they, excuse me, earlier you mentioned that they, have, that they can provide you with access to programs that can possibly provide funding assistance for some of this. Is that yes. correct? Funding yes, and technical? I, 
They have cost share programs and we have a bevy of equipment. Again, not all conservation districts have those resources, but we do, we have, the, we have the fortunate opportunity to have that here in Woods County. We have a large amount of equipment that people can rent or some of our services for like mowing and cutting cedars. Fantastic. Helping prepare fire breaks. Okay, we will pull, everyone will pull that screen back up again in a little bit as far as who to, how to get a hold of your conservation district. Um, we do have another question here for you, Katie, from Betty Turner, and she's asking, did you have to do any wildflower seeding to bring the wildflowers back after your first burns? Um, and if so, what species of plant did you seed? No, no. <laughs> the answer oh, is natural. no. And then you bring the cattle in on it, and the cloven hooves work the earth, and just re bring those old seeds up, and after a burn, the wildflowers are phenomenal after a prescribed burn when they come back. Thank Every you. year seems to be a little different on what the predominant weed is of the year or flower of the year, uh -huh. but it's all good. Yeah, and that photo we had up earlier, it looked like you had some bee balm, some galardia, all kinds of beautiful flowers blooming. So, all right, we got a question from Rachel Jones. Katie, she wants to know, this is like the question of the year. How do you deal with non-native species? We have an entire field of African weeping love grass that was planted on as erosion control and it's stimulated. Ooh, ooh, this sounds awful. It's stimulated by fire and grazing. So we are trying to do neither, but want to do something to reduce the presence on the landscape. I would have to steer you to your local resources of the NRCS. Their rangeland management specialists or the, your local conservation district for some technical guidance on that question. I'm not qualified to answer that. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that one before. So Rachel, let us know what you find out. It's very interesting. Yeah, we don't we don't have love grass. <laughs> we just have love. Kind of curious what part of the state. Let us know if you're, if you're still listening. All right. So our next question comes from. Here, hang on. Okay, Carol, Carol Sabin. She says, Katie Hawk, I have a question for you. Carol, ask away, sister, what you got? Um, she wants to wants to know if I want to answer something about the Monarch license plate live. Sure, send it to me. That one's done. Carol, I'll look for your, your question about the license plate. Um, Laura Murdoch also just, she simply says that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife also offer a cost share program to cut cedars um, and then burn after cutting, which, which helps with the cutting costs. So for all those listening, U.S. Fish and Wildlife also has programs for that too. Hang on here. Um, all right, we got Betty Turner taken care of. Looks like Nikki left. We will follow up with her on another question. Any other questions out there? Carol, if you're still listening, let me know what your license plate question was. And if anybody else has any questions, feel free to text them in. In the meantime, ladies, uh, you mentioned earlier that you had some milkweed pretty close by. Would you be willing to show us? Hang on, okay. I got to un unmute okay, you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Let me flip it around here. Okay, just right up on this ratty little plateau top that we have that isn't really a great grazing area, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I mean, I can just see a dozen of the antelope horns and then right down here in front of me, I've got one, two, the common milkweed plant. Shut off just for a second, Mom. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, one, two, yes. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty. <laughs> you know, that's just within a 12 foot reach of me here that I count that many milkweeds. And here we have our cattle coexisting amongst them just fine. Even, you know, milkweed can be toxic to livestock, but we don't find that to be a problem because we manage our stocking density rates and they don't want to eat it 
because there's so many other good things to eat, especially after a prescribed burn. I mean, they just migrate right to that and want to graze that off. But we have, haven't seen this preponderance of milkweed until we got fire applied to the land here three years in a row. We, we burn a third of the ranch every year. And it's amazing how the milkweed has resurged and come back. Well, that's fantastic. So JS has a question related to that, Katie. He's asking, uh, he asked what kind, but you said antelope, corn, and common. And then he's asking, do you collect the seeds? I tried um, to collect a little bit of the seed a year ago, but I need somebody that's better at it than I am to um, <laughs> catch it. It got away from me. <laughs> But we do have, I have, I've been around it. You have to be right on it when it goes to, uh, to seed. That was on the common. I haven't even tried on this version here. I was looking to see if there was any fat cats Ooh. down there. So pretty. And so essentially though, I don't like the seeds allowing the, them to just dis distribute naturally each year and replenish themselves, I guess you could say. Yeah, and, and that's the, the, really the cloven hoof action of the livestock really does um, stir things up and invigorate things after a burn that brings all those wonderful things back to the surface. Wonderful. That's fantastic. So we've got a couple questions related to that. I think you may have already answered this one, but April Nesbitt, by the way, hi, April. I haven't seen you forever. Boo on COVID. We miss our volunteers. She's an awesome volunteer down south at uh, our Blue River area. April's asking if you see a difference in milkweed abundance after spring burns compared to fall burns. That's a great question, April. It really is a good question. Um, at this time, the only thing I can really tell you positively is that the spring burns we have a huge rebound because that's when they're regrowing and grow coming alive we've only done in our burn association that burning in the later growing season or into the fall is a paradigm shift that we're hoping everybody gets their heads around in the future because you really can burn in a bit any time of the year you just have to make it fit into your management program with your livestock and everything so that it works out but I, I don't know the answer if fall gives you more of a resurgence of it. Um, I would think that it would be good either way. You can't okay. go wrong. So Laura, Lynn, excuse me, Lynn Rankin, we, we spoke with her earlier. She's curious how much on average would you estimate it to cost to burn an acre, per acre, roughly? Oh. Um, the only thing I really have to go on is what the NRCS guidelines are and what they pay per acre. That's sort of how we, and I'm not sure how they come up with all that. I don't have a good answer for you on that. If you had to hire it done professionally, it would probably be, and I, again, I'm speaking on a turn. I don't even know what the professional that do it for business people charge for it. Probably anywhere from 20 to $40 an acre. That'd be high, maybe high, 10 to 40. <laughs> so it might be worth a call to their local county conservation district for that maybe yeah. and, and to, to get but some But as far as the, um, our costs, you know, everything, we have some association equipment that we've accrued with grant money and donations from other agencies like Quell Forever, the Nature Conservancy, Pheasants Forever, whatnot, well, the list goes on, the Noble Foundation, uh, everybody that's out there involved with nature is supporting prescribed burning. But um, I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> that's okay. So it sounds like what I'm hearing from you, it would be good if um, she reached out to her local prescribed burn association and conservation district um, and maybe they can help her get some estimates on costs to burn her property yes but if she joins a prescribed burn association she's part of the association and I suppose I think every association has a few different rules like it, they might have something like a dollar an acre for members just sort of a 
a maintenance fee to support the organization. So if you're running a hundred acres, it's a hundred dollars, you know, that you've donated back to your association. Good to know. Interesting. I didn't realize that. It's like um, having a, a frequent flyer or, you know, a frequent flyer card or something. Every, so. every club, every association is a little bit different. We don't do that in ours. We might down the road. You never know. We might need to have some funds raised to help maintain our equipment, our brush rigs. We have two association brush rigs and a couple of four wheelers and water wagons and a, a burn trailer that was donated to us from the Oklahoma Prescribed Burn Association. Uh, okay. as well as the radios and things like that but um yeah all right so we have a question here from jim elder and he's asking um if someone can visit your ranch and do a butterfly bird and other critter walk <laughs> so um you know <laughs> private ranch so no, we're really not um open to that type of um, thoroughfare out here <laughs> with our cat gap operation and what we have one, going on. One thing I will offer to Jim is to check out the Nature Conservancy's website, nature.org slash OK events. And um, at this time, while, while at this time we do not have any field trips, um, each spring and each fall, we do offer a field trip to Four Canyon out in Western Oklahoma, which is near Katie's ranch is and it's the very it's the same um, Red Hills landscape um, with the same type of ecosystem and critters wildlife and plants so Jim I would recommend that you possibly check check out the Nature Conservancy's events hopefully this fall we can get back into having some public field trips at the Four Canyon Preserve is the one you're going to want to keep your eye on okay um, we also have virtual field trips uh, if anybody's interested in that um, again nature.org slash and you can find more information on that all right so Laura is asking what is your cow slash calf stocking rate oh um, we run about one cow to 15 acres I would say one cow calf pair. Fantastic, thank you. It's not the best grass that we're on out here, but we make it work. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yay, you're welcome, Laura. Um, all right, so there's, I think that's about it as far as ones that are specific for you, Katie. Um, I've got a couple license plates and other things uh, people are asking about, so I'm gonna try to answer those real quick before we close out. Um, Carol's asking regarding the license plate, the original deadline was May 1st for whether the plate would be produced, but it is approved or was the deadline extended? Carol, hopefully you are on our list, but an email will be going out. What a timely question, Carol. You're like a mind reader. An email will be going out on Monday. The license plate was approved. We finally got a, uh, the, we sold the pre-orders, 100 pre-orders last December. We knocked that one out of park really quick that was required by the state for us to get 100 pre-orders. We got that done very quickly. Um, and unfortunately due to COVID and some other delays, the state had had um, needed some extra time to get the plate into production. The plate is now going into production. So we're very excited. So if you pre-ordered one, you can expect to receive it within four to eight weeks. If you haven't pre-ordered one visit, and you want to, visit nature.org slash okmonarchs. And um, you'll see that, that uh, URL magically come up in the chat screen over on the, on, in the chat area, Larissa will send to us. She's an incredible uh, air traffic controller. Thank you, Larissa. So the, the Monarch license plate is in production. We are launching a news announcement and everything next Monday. So we just got word from the tax commission. Great question, Carol. All right, Rachel is asking about help for people who want to do pollinator gardens. Uh, she's looking at about woo, 120 acres and wants to do a garden space that can act as a starting seed source. Rachel Jones, my email address is khawk at tnc.org. Email me, khawk at tnc.org. I uh, would love to chat more with you about that and connect you with some potential resources to make that vision come alive. That's Wow, holy cow, that's a big one. That's fantastic, Rachel. Thank you for your interest in that. Um, let's follow up and see if we can't get you connected to some resources. 
And Carol is also asking, do the fees earned from the license plate by the Nature Conservancy go toward assisting the kinds of events KDB is discussing? Thank you, great question, Carol. So yes, all the fees collected from the license plate, the Monarch license plate go towards Monarch conservation and Monarch outreach. So the fees will support um, the, the work that we're doing via Okies for Monarchs, um, connecting with landowners like we have with Katie, getting the word out about the funding programs that are available, the technical assistance programs that are available, getting more seeds into the, the hands of landowners. So Carol, 100% of those fees, excuse me, of the $20 from the license plate, um, it, we get $20 from each license plate sold and the annual renewals. 100% of that $20 will go towards our Monarch and Pollinator Outreach and Conservation. So great question. Thank you, Carol. Lynn is asking, where is bulk seed available? Great question, Lynn. Uh, I highly recommend visiting okiesformonarchs.org and or just Google Johnston Seed. Johnston Seed in out of Enid, Oklahoma. They have a, an Okies for Monarchs pollinator seed mix. They have multiple um, types available. They have Eastern Oklahoma, Western Oklahoma, and Central Oklahoma wildflower seed mixes for monarchs. And that is what we utilize in our outreach as well. Another bonus to that, Lynn, is that they donate a portion of their proceeds to those seeds, those seed sales back to Okies for monarchs so they can sell to you in bulk um, by the pound or whatever it is that you're looking for um, I, I highly recommend you specifically reach out to Sarah McLaughlin at Johnston Seed. Sarah McLaughlin is an incredible resource and will be happy to talk to you at, about custom developing a, um, an order just for you so thank you Lynn great question um yes and so you're welcome lynn wonderful so laura you asked a question and i'm going to try to answer you offline um in regards to um an answer that a question that you ha i hadn't responded to yet so i'm going to answer you offline there laura um uh, and i think that is about it right quick before we part everyone we are going to look at uh, a couple of important things um first off i want to say a special thank you to Rose and Katie for joining us today. And of course, sweet Sage back there, if you're still back there, kiddo. Uh, she is a working machine, that girl. So um, she's a lot of fun. Thank you so much, ladies, for both of you joining us. For those that are still there, let me share something right quick with you. Oops, hang on here. All right, again, we're bringing up that screen for conservation districts. You should be able to see this now. Um, you can contact your local nursery. They can even tell you if you have a prescribed nurse, so who to reach out to, who's the regional burn manager in your area. They can also talk to you about other programs, funding, cost share programs that are available, funding assistance, technical assistance, equipment assistance. Uh, contact your local conservation district, okay? So the website, okconservation.org slash districts will get you there. Also, be sure to check out uh, the Prescribed Burn Association website that will get you connected with your local Prescribed Burn Association, um, get you information to you about burn workshops that are happening throughout the state. You can also find your local prescribed, um, or excuse me, if you don't have a local Prescribed Burn Association, you can also find out how to start one. We would love to see every single county filled in on this map. That would make us really happy. Uh, last thing that we want to let everyone know about is uh, our Protecting Oklahoma Watersheds is our next webinar coming up on June 10th. Kim Elkin, our Watershed Health Director, will be joining us. She's actually going to broadcast live from the Blue River, which will be a lot of fun. We're going to learn about the different types of watersheds, rivers, streams, um, creeks, different areas that the Nature Conservancy is working on and how you can help us protect them and how you can also just help protect watersheds in your community. So June 10th, uh, from noon to 1 p.m. Uh, we'll see you back here. And in order to attend that, again, as always, you do have to register for the webinars. So visit nature.org slash OK events and you can register there. Nature.org slash OK events. Katie and Katie, I'm going to come back to you just for a final, final hello and goodbye. Thank you, ladies, so much. If you don't mind staying online, don't log off just yet. But we are going to end this webinar session. And a big thank you to all of our folks. Who joined us today? We had a big crew here, and it was a lot of fun. So thank you, everyone, for, for your great questions and joining us with uh, the lovely Blunk ladies. So thank you, everyone. Katie and Rose, stay with us, okay? Okay, bye. All right, be better.